I'm Dan Summer. I'm a fabricator, a driver, and my life just revolves around cars and any activity that will have fun. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, yeah, it's it's in the Midwest, in the middle of nowhere, but it's it's a great town. I love it. I'm new to California. I've been here about two years. I've traveled quite a bit, different car stuff and uh, different jobs, but this is my resting place. So, so where did the danger in Danger Dan come from? Uh, it was kind of a combination of friends of mine um, and family members. So, all right, just the. Uh, I guess more of the backstory of doing stuff on vacation and, and whatnot in a relaxed situation where I would just go a little bit too hard. <laughs> go, go big or go home, Go man. big or go home. <laughs> I usually go too big and get sent home. Any injuries? Uh, yeah, I've got some, but no, I've never broke a bone. I mean, All if right. I could knock on wood, there's every, this whole room is wood. Yeah, so. yeah, pretty much. No, I mean, I've, I've had my share of injuries, but nothing terrible. I've actually managed to escape with minimal injuries All in right. my life, so that's pretty good. All right. <laughs> good deal. I hope that's the rest of your life, man. <laughs> Me too. But yeah. I don't know. Working here, it seems kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially getting a little older now, too. It, it stays in your head where you're like, nah, I'd, Maybe I should hold back just a little bit, but right. sometimes that gets you hurt too. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you only live once. Why not? <laughs> you only right? die once. That's also true. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank you actually before we get going because you were one of the first people that responded to me on Instagram. I started DMing a bunch of people to see who would be able to come on the show yeah. and you responded and I was yeah. pretty happy about that. So now I finally get to talk to you and to, to pick your brain. Right. Right. So, And, and as far as speaking about responding to that stuff is mm-hmm. is i check it fairly often and i try to answer a lot of questions i get a lot of questions mm-hmm. and i get a lot of young guys that are just now you know getting out of school and trying to think where am i going to go or the college what should i do my parents are pushing me this way my you know that's the the influence that people have and it's something that i can relate to because my parents are the same way oh you got to go to college you have to do this but for me to say you know hey if you're interested in fabrication or, or, you know, being a welder or mechanics, like there's plenty of opportunity out there yeah, for that. Yeah. And just to give them a little bit of guidance, you know, just to point them in the right direction. You need that push sometimes. I needed that push, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I had my friends give me that push because I, I had a whole bunch of people tell me that that was not going to work out for me. You know, like they'd rather me do something else. It just wasn't me. You know, it's, it's just something that I, you know, I feel depressed working every day. I'm not, I don't want to do that. This is something I enjoy and I'm good at and I, I like to do it. So telling people to do that, it's kind of fun. Yeah. You know, just to be able to communicate with some guys like, just do it. Go have fun. Yeah. Keep us alive. That's we right. We need more fabricators. We need more mechanics. It's yeah. not competition to me. It's let's keep this alive. Let's work together. Definitely. I think some people underestimate the need for people in the trades, you know, like plumbers, roofers, Mm -hmm. uh, the contracting trades, welders, as you mentioned, it's everybody's trying to get out and do this whole, whatever this thing is. I don't, I I wouldn't even call it white collar anymore. It's just (laughs) no collar, weird shit. You want to pay off student loans? Yeah. That's it. I'm going to work real hard to pay off my student loans. Right. No, there's stuff out there for you already. You know, that's it. Definitely. If, you, if you're passionate about it, go for it. And that's that's what makes it fun. And there's so many opportunities to even stem off of things. If you screw it up and you decide you don't like a certain thing, there, you can do a lot. With fabrication, welding specifically, mm-hmm. you can do so much. So much. And then uh, people don't really realize that. They're like, oh, I want to do it in cars. Like, yeah, but you could also build bike frames. Those guys make pretty good money and get sure. to travel the world. Yeah. And that's one thing I considered doing. Huh. I, I like bikes. I used to like ride mountain bikes all the time. Mm-hmm. I got into welding. I was like, I'd like to build mountain bikes. And then I got into cars. <laughs> <laughs> so the aircraft, all that stuff. You know, welders are a very useful thing. And if you want friends, yeah. let me tell you what, be a welder. Ah. You'll gain a lot of friends. Why is that? Because they'll be like, hey, man, can you uh, just go ahead and stick this together? <laughs> hey, man, I got this. Uh, there's something in my exhaust. So... It's <laughs> got it. If you're a mechanic or a fabricator, you'll pick up some friends. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> you may not want them, but yeah, but they'll friends be there. in quotes, right? <laughs> yeah, they'll be there for you. 
The Midwest. I've been there. My uncles live there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Car culture. Mm, it's not too bad. It's not. Yeah. I mean, I, I was kind of limited into what I saw because I was just in the St. Louis area. Mm -hmm. The only thing I really remember that stuck out, schnooks. Schnooks. Yeah, man. That's, that's the only thing that so, stuck out. The funny thing about schnooks is we were talking about different things for Garage Garage and different ideas. And one of the things that I remember being a kid is yeah. seeing um, a couple parades in St. Louis and there was this big shopping cart from schnooks. Okay. Gigantic. With a big V8. Oh, I mean, I mean, it's okay. massive. And they would drive this thing through all the parades. So they had this shopping cart with a massive V8. And that just stuck with me when I was a kid. I was like, I have to get a ride in that thing. That's ridiculous. So it, it was pretty cool to see. Yeah. Just a, a weird, weird little thing to, to huh. have around St. Louis. But it was kind of an iconic thing. You'd see that in any parade. Yeah. 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 You know, I think I've seen... Other shopping carts with something kind of ridiculous, but maybe Schnooks was the originator. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I, I, it's, I've been since I was a little kid. I'm 33 now, so all right, it's been around for a while. Okay, take us back to where it all started. Actually, for me, I, I think everything had started because my dad he would buy me, you know, like Hot Wheels or mm -hmm. Matchbox cars, mm -hmm. and it's just something that I've always been, I've gravitated to in okay. cars always been drawn to it but nobody in my family is about cars no one i'm i'm the only one <laughs> so okay. it was a lonely little island for me to be uh in, interested in cars and stuff like that sure. um but even just seeing some of the old classics and stuff around you know we had uh, a couple of little drive-in places uh drive-in diners and stuff that mm -hmm. we'd see car shows my dad i would just beg him Let, let's stop me you know let's see this and my dad he knew some about he he, he likes cars yeah just never terribly into it. Sure. So he would he would definitely uh, stop and and let me just look around and and just kind of browse what's going on. And I've, I've seen a lot of old guys and just gravitate to them of, of what they've done to these old machines. And I thought it was so cool. But I mean, I'm from a pretty small town in St. Louis, actually, mm -hmm. outside. So didn't get to go out too much and see many many. You know, like car modification shops or anything like that. There wasn't anything like that near me. Just a couple neighbors that had some really slick cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, one I remember was an old um, Fox body Mustang. Okay. And we used to call him Mustang man, but it was a really, <laughs> really cool Mustang. It was really nice. And even to this day, very nice car, really well built. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things that got me into it. It was just hearing that guy fire that thing up. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's what I want to be a part of. So gotcha. That's kind of instilled in me still being a child and seeing a few things that I know positively that's what I want to do. Yeah. So, you know, you're not the first person to say Fox body Mustang. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people saying Fox body Mustang. Uh, it's, I think that was kind of the term when, yeah. in St. Louis. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean that in the sense of why is that car so influential? to people. I, I, there's a lot of people like Matt Farah built a Fox body. Right. And I, you know, he's, he's shared the story about what he wanted to do with it and why he wanted to do with it. But mm. maybe there's a theory behind it. I don't know. Do you have a theory? <laughs> if I see them, yeah. they're either a big, big piece of shit <laughs> or the fastest thing you've ever seen. It's right. like, there's really no happy medium. Yeah. They're, those old ones, man, they'll, they're, if you see them at the track, they're pulling tires. Yeah. You know, that's it. And that's just something at the, the sound of it too. I think they sound fantastic. Right. I. It's just a cool little car. It's yeah. easy. It's attainable. And it's just, it's something that you see so much of and guys have done right, you know? Yeah. And it's, I guess me growing up as a kid, that's what I saw a lot. You know, sure. that was something that you could buy. Yeah. At, so that was one of the first cars that I ever had. Got it. To, to do something like that was an older Mustang. Got it. You had a Fox body. <sighs> I did. Well... I kind of had one from an ex-girlfriend okay. that, that I, uh, I'd kind of taken ownership of and I uh, just beat the living hell out of it and had a great time. But I, I ended up with a, the, a 95 five Oh, which is about the slowest car ever, ever <laughs> with a 5.0 so, or just it's ever so bad. It's so bad. I, I think my minivan was faster. No shit. Yeah. So it was a, terrible car but when i was 16 years old i thought it was hot yeah so. yeah the new body <laughs> style is a little swoopy yeah. a little bit more modern it's that 90s you know that 90s feel to it everything's a little curvy and you know that's totally i, I think that's the era i'm stuck in with cars that's why you know i have an s14 now 
mm-hmm. and that was my first drift car. All right. I just love those little round, bubbly, stupid cars. Um, Supra, FDR, X7, all of that. I just love that. That's where I'm stuck. Got it. That's a good place to be stuck. <laughs> yeah. Have you been to Radwood? I have not. Oh, man. I have not. That would be I, heaven for you. I would love to go. Yeah. I, I saw everything about it, but I actually had to be somewhere else. Ah, I gotcha. And uh, I saw these guys' Instagrams lighting up all over, and yeah. now I'm mad I didn't go. <laughs> There's always next year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're not, they're not slowing down, those guys. That's for damn sure. Yeah. And next year, I'll have a car maybe to go join with That'd them. That'd be so. rad. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So you are the shop foreman here at Hoonigan. Mm-hmm. I use my hands a lot. Yeah. I do too. I'm trying not to, so I don't make much noise. Yeah. No, you could definitely use your hands. Just don't slap anything. <laughs> slap anything. Yeah. Including me. I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I that. slap everybody. Yeah, so it's all good right. deal. So you're the shop foreman here. Uh, foreman? Foreman. 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 foreman? For, I don't know. What's foreman. Foreman. I'm the shop foreman. You're the guy. I'm the guy. That does the <laughs> thing with the thing. I try. And you create stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So... Let's go back a bit because you played with the Matchbox cars and the Hot Wheels cars. I think all car guys, they grow up and they go, yeah, I've had some kind of affinity of playing with those little toys. Mm -hmm. There's obviously something there. There's a transition for playing with those cars into, you know, adulthood, I guess. Yeah. So how did you get to being a mechanic? Well, I'd say after about 2,000 Matchbox cars later, which I still have, um, I... I've got into real cars. I, I, I've always been kind of a, a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. I, I'll do any, you know, I love skateboarding, dirt bikes, all of that. But as soon as I turned 16, I could get a car. Man, it, it just went from there. We didn't have many shops around us mm-hmm. at all. Like, I, I didn't really hear of any performance shops. And even the ones that near, were near us weren't good shops. They weren't reputable. <laughs> I only heard really bad things about them. So for me to actually do my own stuff and working on my own budget... You know, I, I didn't have too much money, so I I had to learn everything myself. Yeah. And this is right, you know, when the internet forums and stuff sure. first started. Yeah. So it was perfect timing for me just to be able to read everything that I needed to know. Right. When forums were huge, that's when I was getting into cars. So reading the knowledge that everybody else has around the country, around the world, was really helpful to me because I've always been mechanically inclined. I... You know, I worked uh, construction with my father and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But as far as cars went, I knew nothing. So <laughs> I'd read, take stuff apart, try and figure out how to put it back together. And, and you know, it started small with intakes and stuff like that. But okay. well, as the progression of me wanting to go faster and then dive deeper into stuff, you know, I'd do suspension, brakes, all the general maintenance stuff was pretty easy for me. But then when it came time to, all right, now I want to do motor swaps and stuff like that which mm-hmm. required fabrication I think that's what I was really drawn to was the custom work rather than just the maintenance of uh, you know alright I got a new shocks and lowering it and all that the fabrication work like oh, I'm going to cut the front end off of this car <laughs> and hopefully I can put this back together so again reading and uh, joining up with a bunch of friends you know I, I had a really good group of friends mm-hmm that were as motivated as I was in in the car scene and wanted to learn and also, you know, very good mechanics to begin with. So it's good to have that core group of friends to help push you, you know, like I'm not here alone, I'm not lost. Right, right. You know, I've spent many hours in the garage by myself trying to figure shit out and like, well, I have no idea, now I'm lost. Yeah. <laughs> but, but having a friend be like, oh no, you have to put this in first. Like, oh yes, thank you. So that, that was a big start for me is, um, I guess right when I was about 20 years old, when I first got into cars, I was drawn to muscle cars, Mm -hmm. right? And Mustangs, Camaro, stuff like that. And, um, then my buddy took me drifting and that was it. It was over. Uh, He took me in his S14. It was SR20 swapped, blew my mind. I was just blown away. I was like, have to do this hundred percent have to do this. And I dove in full force. He hit me right at the right time. I just sold my truck, which was an expensive truck, (laughs) and I had way too much money, so I ended up buying an S14 that week. Wow. And then uh, that's when I started, you know, learning about everything and and buying parts and everything else. And I I set that car up within weeks, and then I need an SR20, you know, and that's where my mind went. Like, I need my car to be like his, because that car is amazing. Right. So I built basically his car to a T 
in a very short amount of time, which he'd already done all the all yeah. the hard part. Sure, sure. So just learning from him is, you know, how I, I got to do that. So the 90s stuff then, that that's what I was drawn to. My S14 is where I started. Mm-hmm. Did that for years. But now I feel like through doing a bunch of drifting for over 10 years, now I have an old 64 Biscayne, Chevy Biscayne. And okay. I love it so much. And I've always wanted to build something old, cool, classic. So I think my style is changing again back to where it is, but I want to keep that Japanese flavor, do something like a 2J in it or, you know, just <laughs> why not? You know, it's yeah. something that I know and, and uh, I love the sound and everything as well. So, yeah, I guess some people will call that blasphemy. <laughs> Man, I don't think so these days. I yeah, think, I don't think so. Either. I think nothing, I mean, nothing hasn't been done. You know, every, every time you think you have an original idea, Go look it up. Oh, Somebody, for sure. Somebody's done it, you yeah, know? Yeah, So I think, um, to me, what, if it makes you happy, do it, you know? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, who, they did it first. Who cares? Go have fun. Well, there's also the purists that go, you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, well, those guys are stick in the mud sometimes. Right, absolutely. They're not, not willing to have as much fun. No. But, I mean, there is some time, there, there's been the currents in my life where I wanted to be a purist. Hmm. I didn't actually want to be a purist. So I bought <laughs> okay. I bought a 97 Mercedes AMG. And that All was right. one of their first installments with AMG, right? So there wasn't many of those cars. The W202 chassis. It's a 3.6 liter inline mm-hmm. six. And it had a blown motor. And I saw it because I love that chassis. I just, I love the way they look for whatever reason. I was like, I'm going to buy that and put a 2J in it. Okay. And uh, so I bought it. And then after I researched the car a little bit and started reading into it. I was like, well, this is really rare. There's only 250 of them. And then like, well, it makes really good power. And they made this car just to beat the M3. That's cool. And uh, so it took me a step back. I was like, well, maybe I'll, I was like 300 horsepower is pretty good for an NA inline six. That's about what I was going to look for, for a 2J. Yeah. So I uh, went and tried to buy a new one. I did. I bought an AMG motor from California and, um, I tried my hardest to get that <laughs> in and get it to work. And man, I, like the install went fine and uh, I just couldn't get it to run. And uh, it's came up to something about being um, with the flex plate and uh, also the, just with the timing. Mm. Couldn't figure it out for the life of me. Took it to AM. I finally gave up mm-hmm. after multiple tries. So there's six different um, sensors and six different flex plates. So okay. that's quite a big number that yeah. you can interchange. It's very German. With nobody to know, you know, who, which one's correct. Right. Between the years and the motor and everything else. And even the AMG guys didn't know. <laughs> so I just gave up, took it to them and they're like, nah, nah, I don't know. So <laughs> I gave up and I was like, I should have put a 2J in that. And that was the end of me being a purist. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over it. So did so. you end up putting a 2J no, in it? No, I sold it for a Miata. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Two Miatas actually. Two Miatas. Two NA Miatas. Yeah. Gotcha. What prompted you to get Miatas after a German built rocket? Uh, I mean, my buddy had one. Okay. And- you know, we used to give in to him for having a Miata and then he let me borrow it and that was it. <laughs> it's the most fun you can have in a car. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. They're so much fun. I just for a little track, get around car and I'm, I'm, I'm a drift guy by heart. So, and I, I also like to do, you know, some PDX and stuff like that as well. So it's pretty fun yeah. and it's yeah. just a, a cheap car to get into and, and easy and fun to maintain and. That's one of our prized possessions here is the shark cart. It's yeah. a Miata. Yeah. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite car here. So Yeah. No, it's uh it's one it's a sight to behold. It you, <laughs> you see it on the uh the television. Well, I at least watch you guys on my uh my TV. Yeah, that's how I watch our stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I have to justify putting a television in my house at this point. So I have to watch you guys or anything else for that matter. I don't really watch a lot of YouTube or television at all, really, because I don't have the time. Mm-hmm. But you guys are one of my playlists. And I have to watch you on that TV screen. I have to justify that purchase. Well, thanks for watching. Yeah, my <laughs> pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for putting out the content. Hey, any day. Nice. Every day, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. We, it's every day. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, you guys are hustling. The hustle <laughs> yeah. gang, right? Is that what they say? Yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what Brian Scotto said when I interviewed him. Awesome. He said you're the most versatile person at Hoonigan. I don't know what he means by that <laughs> as far as that maybe I can fit in more places than people. 
Um, yeah, I understand what he means because I, I just generally like to jump into things. Sure. You know, and I would like to help out in any way possible. Mm -hmm. Um, being a mechanic isn't my only thing, you know, and, and I was really only being a mechanic and a fabricator out of necessity for me to drive cars. Mm. That's, that was the end goal for me, driving cars, not being a fabricator, not being a mechanic driving. That's all I, all I wanted to do. So, um, I drive pretty well sometimes <laughs> <laughs> we all so right. so yeah i'd like i like to drive i like to build and then i like to talk to people meet people and and also come up with ideas with the boys too so sure well, i try and have my hand in almost everything okay so. all right fair enough yeah so i want to go a little bit deeper into that whole versatile thing mm -hmm. so you have to be pretty versatile as a mechanic mm -hmm. so did you start with i'm going to be a mechanic or did you try to go somewhere else and it pulled you back because I know you said this, the necessity, mm -hmm. but let's talk professionally here for a second. So professionally for me, what, when I started out, I was in construction mm -hmm. and um, I was working on my own cars in my spare time. And like I said, I had a good core group of friends and I, one in particular, one of my best friends, Mike, we worked together every day and just hit it off, you know, and we, we had just come up with new things, new exciting things to, to do to our cars. And we're always learning. And he's somebody I really gravitated to. And he's a really sharp guy and a really good mechanic. And I just gravitated to him and watched every move that he made and, and learned from him. And, uh, I think he did the same with me because I, that's where the fabrication came in for me. It's mm -hmm. like, I would think about things differently than he would as far as fabrication. Um, but then he, he had me kind of shadow him at a shop before just to try it out. Okay. And uh, after a while of us doing stuff, we're, we ended up working on our own friends' cars all the time. You okay. know? And so everybody knew us as the guys to come to to work on stuff. And he's like, hey, I'm going to start this business. And I think we could do it. You and I, let's do this. And I kind of was a little apprehensive about it, but quit my job with my dad <laughs> for the construction company I worked for for a long time. And uh, I was like, let's do this. Let's go full into it. So we had our own mechanic shop and then basically doing small fabrication and, and uh, drift setup stuff. And that ran for quite a while. So we did a lot of general maintenance is what kept the doors open. Sure. But we did a lot of tuner stuff as well. And that's what, you know, kept us interested. Yeah. So I'd say I got over the mechanic work <laughs> <laughs> just from general maintenance, you know? Yeah. It, it's something that yeah, it's not for everyone. It's definitely not for me. I hate the monotonous work and, and it's, I don't like it, but I do appreciate that I did it Yeah, because then it makes me think about everything, <laughs> even my own cars or my friends, you know, I, to be able to help out and just have that knowledge. But the fabrication's re really where I wanted to be. I want to make stuff, you know, that's, that's where it was. So that's what I'm still drawn to. That's why we have a uh, garage garage and stuff yeah. like that just to make, very ridiculous items and, and have fun. And that's something that Mike and I did back in the day. We built a tube chassis car we called the Coyote. Okay. So it was basically an S13 subframes, just the subframes. Mm -hmm. And we built everything. We built the tube frame, everything. So it was basically like square tube uh, rails. And then we built a roll cage off of that. And it had an SR20, super fast, super fun. And that's where kind of the crazy stuff started with us. And we just making things left and right it's <laughs> just for fun so the midwest isn't really known for racetracks so where did you guys go well we had a gateway which okay. was maybe half hour from us oh, okay so that's pretty and it's close. a big track mm -hmm. it's a really big infield for drifting it's really fast mm -hmm. and actually they just brought formula drift there this is the first year they've gone okay. to st louis and a lot of people really like that track. It was really well received. It's very fast. Mm -hmm. It was the fastest one on the circuit. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Good you're deal. triple digit entries. Triple uh, digit. Oh yeah. Entries. Okay. Yeah. It's so. a butthole clencher moment. Right there. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. And uh -huh. uh, yeah, there's, if, if you wreck there, it's a good one. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think more of what happens around the Midwest, you see a lot of dirt car stuff yeah, and, yeah. And, and things like that, but there, there are, there's a lot of tracks fairly close. Okay. So if you're willing to drive, which I was back in the day, I traveled everywhere. I drove my car. I'd go to Atlanta, Tennessee, Wisconsin, whatever weekend. My buddies would be like, hey, let's go down to this event. 
all right, five hour drive, go hit the track, drive back and go to work the next day. So wow. the next day, the next day. Okay. Yeah. I drove my car, I didn't trailer it. <laughs> the car that you were taking to these events oh, yeah. and racing roll, in the ca- events. roll cage, everything. Okay. And drove it down there full of tires and tools and uh, drive all weekend, crash on someone's couch <laughs> and then uh, head home in the morning. So how's your back? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've softened up my suspensions <laughs> so, okay. since then, but yeah. All right. Let's talk about the creativity that you have going on. Cause you, you mentioned that, like you did the monotonous <clears throat> thing and I know how that could be tough. Cause my dad, I, he, I mentioned this on the podcast all the time, but my dad had a shop for a long, long time. Hmm. And it was out of necessity cause we came to this country and he needed to do something and he was an engineer. So he had to do that and he understood it. And I saw the same thing over and over and over again at the shop. And my dad doesn't like cars anymore. Mm. So talk to me about like the actual creativity that you wanted to have. And I get that, you know, building the, uh, the track car is one thing, but you, it almost seems like if after you build a track car, you build another track car and then you build another track car and the principle is pretty much the same. Yeah. Right. So what happened there? If anything did. So, yeah, with every track car that I've ever built, it's just kind of, I have my own recipe mm-hmm. that I follow. You know, this is what I like okay. and it makes it easy. It's a cookie cutter car. But as far as creativity, there's always things that I've wanted to do that I've not had, you know, time or budget for. And that's why I love this job as an outlet for some of that. It's just, you know, we can, we can think of the craziest things and then put them in motion as as long as everyone agrees. All right, this is going to be fun. You know, that's something I'd like to do. Um, we have come up with some weird things. It's not, <laughs> it's not just me as far as the creativity in uh, garage garage. It's a, and uh, all of our other shows for that matter. You know, it, it comes from a group of people of just having a funny conversation and, you know, Hey, let's, let's make something that, you know, remember those little tykes cars that you had when you were a kid? And I was like, huh, what about a car bed? You know, well, let's make one of those drive. And, you know, that's, that's just kind of the conversation that we have. And that Brian's like, oh, I love that. Let's do it. <laughs> and then there becomes that moment where I go, oh, shit, how do I make this a reality? Right, right. <laughs> I have to do this now. So, um, and there, there's really no time from thinking of it. There's no concept. It's just, let's do it. And so got to jump right into it. And that's what makes things kind of difficult. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Um, I, it's... uh. One of the things that makes me scared on the show is, boy, I hope this works <laughs> uh, because <laughs> I don't think uh, many people want to see me fail, but me, maybe even if we do fail, it's still funny. Yeah, so yeah. as long as we really reach for it, then, but I, I'm, I always want everything to work. That's, sure. That's yeah. the thing. I, I don't want to fail. So it's uh, hard to come up with concepts and then make them actually work. Right. And of course, you have a whole bunch of people telling you different ways to do it. So. Yeah, I don't really remember any failures. I know that shit car was uh, not really a failure because you guys mobbed in it left and right. And yeah, then the Miata cart. What do you guys call it? The shark cart. Shark cart. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought it was shark cart, but <laughs> I didn't want to sound stupid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's one of those things we had uh, people comment. Yeah. For the name of the car. And that's one we picked. Okay. Everybody, everybody laughed when we heard that. So. So I can understand certain frustrations, especially when you're doing something that is so left field. Concept wise, you have something in your head, but if it doesn't work, I'm assuming that things don't work sometimes, right? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. run me through the process of that. So with shit car, we, we, ha- we wanted to turbo it mm-hmm. because we wanted to just have more fun with it and, and get a little, little more power out of it. We knew it was on its last leg. The motor is just going. Yeah. So let's force some more, more power through it. You know, that's, that's the theory. (laughs) Right. Okay. We'll finish this thing off. Sure. So we got a turbo kit and it just did not fit. I think it was just completely wrong. (laughs) So, and it was going to take a lot of work to do so. And, um, Brian and Vinny both mentioned about putting the turbo in the rear. Thought that would be funny. And as, as they mentioned that, I was like, I'm already doing it. <laughs> so at the, at the first mention of it, I was like, that sounds great. Let's do it. So I started mounting the turbo in the rear and uh, made the exhaust mount up to it, which is probably too big in hindsight. And then I was like, all right, now with the intercooler, let's just run it over the roof because why not? 
You know, (laughs) instead of making it efficient, let's make it hilarious. So ran it over the roof and um, it was kind of a a big pain in the ass to get everything to actually work. And it it didn't really work very well. Yeah. But it did see positive boost. And that was something that I was proud of. I was like, it actually works. It really does work. If, If we had a decent motor, I'd like to give it an actual go. But the the theory behind that as well, we were going to blow that motor up and the six cylinder could move it because we want to swap a six cylinder into it from Mm -hmm. the M3. We have one on the shelf that could move the turbo even being that far away. So now all I have to do is pull that motor out, make a new exhaust and it's done. Okay. Turbo in line six. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. I think, I think that will be the next step of shit car and that that'll breathe back life into one of our favorite cars. <laughs> nice. It's a nice little preview. Yeah. Here of what you guys are hoping to yeah, do. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, when it when it comes to the builds and and everything like that, it sounds like you're having a blast. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Right. And that and I was getting to that. So, you can have an idea and it could probably it sounds like you guys are all put it together. Mm. But sometimes that idea is so difficult to execute. I don't know how calm you are, but it could create some anxiety and some panic. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Have you guys gone through that process where you're just going like, I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and uh, even with Shredbed, when we had no idea and we're still currently going on. So today was a test day and I'm not going to tell you what happened, but I'm smiling. So <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to tune in on Tuesday. All right. So, um, yeah, there, there's definitely a stress to it because sometimes I have no idea what I'm doing Yeah, and I'm going to have to learn as I go. And I think that's one of the cool things about the show that's relatable is that you get to see what's actually, it's not staged, man. It's not, it's, I have no idea what's going on right now. Let's learn together. Sure. And sometimes I'll even read comments and be like, that dude's right. <laughs> you know, like I, I see that, see it in uh, YouTube comments or, or on Instagram. So guys will comment like you did this wrong or why didn't you do that? And I'm like, well, shit, I'm going to jack that guy's idea. That was right. great. Yeah. Because I am learning, you know? Sure. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a certain pressure there. Like this better do well, or what are we going to do? Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's, but it's always fun, you know, uh, and everybody here is willing to help and, at least uh, throw in ideas or, or what we could do. Yeah. And it's, it's not too bad to call a friend. You know, we have, <laughs> we have, we have a lot of friends that are uh, able to help us out and, you know, mo- people will watch the show and even call us, you know, different companies and like, you know what, you should probably look into doing this and like, come here and help me. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. So it's, it's fun to interact with other people and, uh, and it's almost like we're creating it together, you know? Right. Yeah. So, there's information out there that, that is to be had, but just to even come up with the idea is fun. You know, sure. we come up with an idea and if people can help us along the way to execute it, perfect. Okay. But sometimes, yeah, get a little lost in the shop where I'll wake up at night and be like, I have no idea what I'm going to do tomorrow. <laughs> I think I have an idea, but I don't have an idea. So I guess just wing it and see what happens, right? <laughs> That's pretty much 85% of my job is winging it. That sounds yeah. great. That sounds fun. That's a really good... Big creative release, if you ask me. For sure. Yeah. Shoot from the hip. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing about creative releases is there's, there's, I think there's like two different kinds of people. They're the people that really just want to have fun. And then the people that are like, no, this is like my art. This is like, this is my creative release. (laughs) Which of the two are you? (laughs) I'm the fun one. Yeah. Yeah. I would not call anything I have art (laughs) as far as... (laughs) I'm not an artist. I'm just here to have fun. But, you know, you could technically call yourself an artist because you're coming up with these ideas. I mean, there, there are ideas coming left, left sure. and right as well, but you're the one that's fabricating, right? And I think mm-hmm. you guys have a little bit of help, right? Yeah, sometimes. Depends on what department. But most of the time, I fabricate everything in-house. If we don't have it, I'll make it. Okay. And w- what sucks is we're actually pretty limited on tools. Mm. And by pretty limited, I mean less than a lot of people have in their own garage at home. Okay. <laughs> so... It's, it makes it difficult, especially between Brad and I, you know, we're fighting over tools Mm -hmm. because he's got a project going on and I have a project going on Uh, when we're not working together, you know, then that makes it difficult because we're like on time restraints have to get this done and we're pretty ill prepared for some things. So, but that also, again, makes it more relatable to people like, you know, I just have an angle grinder today. So I made a tool (laughs) to make this work, you know? Yeah. But really with a welder and an angle grinder, you can do about anything. 
Sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. And some steel, right? Yeah. You gotta and, have something to, to grind and angle. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a few good materials and uh, that's about it. So, How did you end up in California? Was it because Hoonigan recruited you? I was actually working with a couple of Formula Drift teams. Okay. So that's what brought me out here. Um, I had a friend go over to Japan mm -hmm. one time and uh, went for a drift vacation over at Abyssy Circuit mm -hmm. and um, met up with Andy from Power Vehicles and Andy was going to compete in the US. It was going to be his first season competing Formula Drift Pro 1 in the US and he was building a car at the time, had a few weeks left and said, do you know anybody who's crazy enough to <laughs> fly out overnight and help finish this car, you know, that's good enough. And uh, he's like, yeah, I, I got my buddy, Dan. He called me and instantly I was like, oh yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> so I, I flew out and uh, helped my friend Andy finish the car. They're both Andys, by the way. <laughs> my friend Andy and Andy Gray. Um, and they kind of gave me instruction of what needed to happen in the car. And him and I just got to work. We finished this car. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, by the way, you know, I'm a drift guy as well. And, you know, I've been driving for a while. And he's like, oh, you want to be my spotter? For the first event and I was like sure <laughs> so then I ended up running the whole season with him for Formula Drift being his spotter and then we became pretty good friends he asked me to come back to Japan with him help him build the car and also finish up their season of Formula Drift Japan so I moved to Japan and um, I worked with him for about four months built a car for Tokyo Auto Salon and the, the next season of Formula Drift mm -hmm. and that was a brilliant time but in that time where I was on his team under the umbrella of uh, Bridges Racing, which is Dean Carney in the Viper, uh, I'd met them. So when I was done in Japan, Dean called me right up, <laughs> said, hey, I would like you to come out to California, help me finish up this Viper for next season if you want to, you know, join our team. Mm -hmm. So did that, ended up in Huntington Beach with those guys at Bridges Racing and uh, worked full season with them, uh, just being their lead fabricator with uh, building the new Viper. So that was a fun, fun project. Okay. All <laughs> and right. then uh, also working with James and Peter at Worthouse. Okay. Uh, under the same roof. And then these guys got wind that I was kind of done in the Formula Drift scene. So they asked me to come in for an interview and that's where uh, Hoonigan uh, showed up from in my life. Gotcha. But I'd known Brian and Hurt both before Hoonigan was really a big deal. So what do you mean you were done with, with drifting? So that is a lot to take in. Okay. I mean, and, and this is information for guys who are getting into, you know, professional level, uh, any, any form of racing. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to be a wrench uh, or a fabricator, any, any something, any sanctioned body that is you know, drag racing to, to formula cars, anything like that, it's, it's a lot to take in. It takes over your life and you have to be ready at any point in time to, to just, drop everything and go to wherever you're going. And it's a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. Cars never work the way you want them to. <laughs> Don't care how good you are. They never do. And what you think is going to take two hours is going to be five hours, you mm -hmm. know? So it's, it gets to be very stressful, especially, you know, not having a certain place to, to stay and rest. And, uh, it wears on yourself as far as, you know, my passion being cars. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to do after working on somebody else's car all day is work on my own. Yeah. yeah. So it takes a bit of the passion way of it. Um, so that's kind of, the, I just wanted to step aside just a little bit. I, I There's also parts I love about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I love the, that we work so hard. And then if, when it pays off, then that's the best feeling ever. You know, say you win and you had to go, you're up at five in the morning changing a motor and didn't sleep a wink and working through the next day of all these different issues. You win that day. That's a good day. That feels really good. Like we did it, you know, that's fun. But the other parts when you don't win. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It really takes a toll on you just day in day out. Drifting's a contact sport. Yeah. Crashing. It's, yeah. You're always working. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you're putting on a fender, taking off a fender. Oh uh, yeah. Stretching things out. I wish a fender was the, most of it, <laughs> <laughs> the diff, the trans, you know, that's the stuff that wear on you. Yeah. The bigger stuff. Yeah. Did you have a plan after it sounded like there was a burnout, right? And a lot of mm -hmm. times you burn out and you just kind of go, I need a break Yeah, and maybe I'll come back to this. Yeah. So I didn't really have a plan and I was offered 
from multiple different Formula Drift teams um, for a different season. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if I wanted to or not. And I made a decision because I, you know, I had some time off to think about it. Look, well, I'd rather stay in California than go back home. (laughs) So to, to find my way here and already have a job opportunity offered to me, it's like, well, maybe I'll do this. So on my way to another team, that's when Nads called me up and said, Hey, why don't you come in to Hoonigan? So, okay. Yeah. Then that's when I stopped in. I'm just curious as to the interview process. Cause I've had a couple of people tell me what the interview process was, including Vinny mm. and, uh, Brian's a, a hell of a character and he is the creative visionary here. Mm. So I'm just curious because I'm trying to figure out if you had a job description because it doesn't sound like right now you don't really have a job no. description if it were coming from me. Yeah, no way. Yeah. It, I couldn't tell you what it is. Got it. So what were you thinking? Like you're, you're sitting across from this guy. This company's fairly new. They, they're doing these crazy videos and you know, obviously there's the affiliation with Ken Block. But what was in your head? From what I thought was going to happen mm-hmm. was I thought I was going to be more uh, behind the scenes. Got it. And and fixing all the shit that these guys break, <laughs> you know. And um, I've always been a very personal person. I, I don't mind being on camera or talking to people, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know that they're like, "Would well, do you feel comfortable being on camera?" I was like, "Yeah, no problem." But I figured it would be very minimal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, it's just you know, when can you start? It, basically, the interview went as such: I walked in, waited for a few minutes. Spoke with Nads, which who whom I've met before, mm-hmm. and then Hurt walked in uh, late to work. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, whatever. Not to throw him <laughs> under the bus. It was just in Hurt fashion. Okay. Well, uh, he walked in and uh, we said hi. You know, because we we're old friends. We we had been in the drift scene for a long time. Mm-hmm. I'd known him before Hoonigan even existed, and. Uh, you know, he asked me why I was here. I told him oh, I'm from an interview. I heard him walk behind this wall over here and goes, Hey, that dude rules. <laughs> so then Brian came over and he goes, Oh, it's you. When he walked around the corner, he's like, let's tour the shop. And he just showed, he was basically being, give me a sales pitch. Okay. So at that point I felt like, I, th- I think I got this job. <laughs> okay. He's like, well, so uh, when can you start? And I was like, now. So then, and, and it did. <laughs> I met Rob Parsons and we went straight to work. Okay. And uh, we were on a camera a lot more than I thought. And then ended up <laughs> kind of shooting and stuff myself even for the first bit because uh, some of the shooters were on different projects and they didn't, they were kind of worn thin. Mm-hmm. And man, it really got, got going fast. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy it. It's fun. So how was that transition? Because it sounds like you just jumped into it, mm-hmm. but I'm sure there's a little bit of a learning curve. Oh yeah, definitely. Because... You know, just to even pick up how these guys operate around here, but mm-hmm. everybody's so nice and willing to help, you know, it was, and me being the new guy, it was, you know, they're wanted to help, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was pretty cool. And, and, um, Kyle, uh, one of our editors, he was new as well. So we we're learning together and kind of developed our own style, as you'd say, mm-hmm. you know, as far as shooting and then how we thought about things and, so this is something they hadn't really done too much of as far as the the show and doing a build project. So it was kind of a new concept to them and we ran with it and they liked it. So they let us kind of do our own thing and that's where Shark Cart came. That was my first real project and it was really, really fun. So from there, it made things pretty simple. Is like, no, now we have kind of a formula. Let's stick to that and, and have fun with it. And uh, it's been pretty good ever since. Got it. You do the build breakdowns too. Yeah. Uh, build biologies. Build biologies. Mm-hmm. Right. So how was that something that came through? Like they, they didn't have that before you. They, no. You, you no. started that. Uh, yeah. I, I was the first one in the show for that. Um, I'd explained to Brian before and mo- uh, a lot of guys would talk back and forth and it was like, to be honest with you, I hadn't watched the show that much <laughs> because I feel like, you know, being a car guy, some of it is just, you tune it out. But some stuff I see on there is like, I want to know more about that car rather than just seeing a burnout because some of that <laughs> entices me. You know, I love seeing that action and everything sure. else, but there's so much more that I, I, I enjoy about seeing the cars and, and what guys do to it. And having this platform that we have now, it's like, we can have these guys in here. Guys are excited to be on the show and, and talk about cars. Why wouldn't we throw it on the lift? 
and see what everybody's done. You know, let's let's talk about it in depth. There's guys out there that want to that are like me and want to see and want to have the knowledge of what you know, and even the creativity side of it. You know, there's stuff that you don't even think about that other guys are doing that I want to see, and I just want to know where their heads at as far as building it. So when the show was coming out, I made sure like we're not getting the owner of the car. We're getting the builder. So whoever has the most knowledge of the car, and sometimes the owner is the builder, which is the first build biology is a friend of mine, Mm. Justin Pollock. And he's a formula drift driver and he did all his own work. And it's cool to pick his brain over everything and, and how things work and how things progress through drifting and, you know, where he started as opposed to where he is today and and doing everything himself. And, And that was really cool to me. So I think, that's why people enjoy the show. Mm-hmm. It's really taken off um, because there's some interesting stuff out there. Yeah. There's some really cool cars and our lineup now for Build Biology, I'm super excited about. This season is better than the first season, even though we had some really banger cars in there, but this one's really stacked and a couple of Ken's cars as well. So you've experienced a lot in the automotive world and now you're an automotive celebrity. So how does that make you feel? It can be strange. But I, I do like it. I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's fun to be able to, it's an outlet to connect with people, mm-hmm. you know, whereas before you, people would be quiet and reserved and not want to talk to you. You know, maybe they have questions that they want answered. For me, being the fabricator, mechanic and stuff, it's something that a lot of guys are interested in. Mm-hmm. So that's a lot of the questions I'll get if people ask. And it's kind of fun to, you know, teach the younger guys and you know you know try to get them excited it feels like you're actually doing something at some point you know like sure. trying to motivate people to to keep the car culture alive and that's that's something i'm really passionate about i i really enjoy that you know so i can talk to people about that for hours it doesn't bother me at all so that that's a that's a cool thing for me to that's what i take away from it Dan, I really enjoyed sitting down with you. It was so much fun. So thank you very much for sitting down with me here at uh, Hoonigan HQ. Um, please tell people where to find you and to find your videos. So shoot. All right. So if you follow the Hoonigans on the YouTube channel or our bonus channel, Hoonigan Bonus, mm-hmm. we do a lot on the bonus channel. And that's actually some of my favorite content because that's stuff that not a lot of people see. There's some behind the scenes. That's the fun stuff. Um, it seems more like the old days when we were allowed to, it was wild, wild west sort of deal. <laughs> but if you want to catch me uh, anywhere, you'll see me at uh, any drifting events out out here. I'm, I'm probably going to be there. But on the channel, you'll see me build biology, build breakdown, uh, garage, garage. And well, I'll pop up almost every, every single show. So you can see me almost any day of the week, depending on how crazy my workload is. But as of right now, Build Biology and Garage Garage are really what's going big for me um, and maybe scattered throughout Scumbag Labs, which is probably one of my favorite shows. <laughs> you know, that's that's another thing where we get those crazy ideas out there. Right. But uh, Instagram, DangerDan3. You see me on Twitch for sure. So follow us on Twitch. We'll be live streaming there. Um, mm-hmm. Do a lot of gaming, a lot of talking, a lot of eating fries. <laughs> All stuff. right. Um, Twitch is uh, a new thing for us and it's really fun so we're getting uh, getting used to that definitely playing a lot of games which is really good the Road Stories podcast is recorded and edited by me Michael Sandrovich if you like the show please leave me a review wherever you listen it helps the show greatly and finally please follow me on Instagram at Road Stories Mike thanks so much for listening